many academics are coming to the conclusion that the kind of value added a print-only press can supply is insufficient to compensate for the many disadvantages associated with publishing a book in this fashion. These disadvantages include well, the length of time it generally takes for a print-only book published with a mainstream press to appear. This is often anything between nine months and two years after submission of the final manuscript. The high price such presses attach to their books and the effect this has on the accessibility and dissemination of an author's research. Non-open access books are available only at specific times and places, according to bookshop and library opening times, for example. And then only to those who can afford to pay for access to them in the form of book cover prices, library subscriptions, and so on. Books published open access, however, are instantly accessible for free from any desk or laptop, anywhere with, in, with internet access, 24 hours a day. This means open access books are more visible and easier to search for and find, which in turn means they're more likely to be used and consulted, while evidence from the sciences suggests publishing open access significantly increases the amount of text is cited. But there's also the need for conventional academic publishers and even university presses to make decisions about what to publish more on the basis of the market and a given text potential value as a commodity and less on the basis of its quality as a piece of academic scholarship. And this last factor is currently making it hard for many authors in the humanities to publish books that are perceived as being difficult, advanced, specialised, obscure, radical, experimental or avant-garde. It's also making it hard for early career academics to publish the kind of research-led monographs that are needed to acquire that all-important first-time, first full-time position. Since they need to have one or two books to get a foot on the career ladder, this means we're in effect letting publishers make decisions on the future of the humanities and who gets positions and who doesn't on an economic basis according to the needs of the market or what they believe those needs to be rather than according to scholarly values. But academics are also publishing open access for ethical and political reasons. Many humanities disciplines like to think of themselves as being politically engaged. Yet the humanities have something of a blind spot when it comes to the politics of the academic publishing industries would actually make them possible, especially as those industries have become increasingly consolidated and profit-intensive in recent years. That said, however, more and more humanities scholars are coming to recognise the importance of making copies of their work freely available online because they believe well that our commitment to the value of research carries with it a responsibility to circulate it to all those who are interested in it including those in less affluent parts of the world rather than restricting access merely to those who can afford it as we do now Still, for all that, open access in the humanities continues to be dogged by the perception that online publication is somehow less credible than print and lacks rigorous standards of quality control. And this leads to both open access journals and book publishers being regarded as less trustworthy and desirable places to publish and as too professionally risky for career, early career scholars especially. And it's precisely this perception of open access that Open Humanities Press, the open access publisher I've established with Siggy Jotka and David Otina and Paul Ashton, is being designed to counter. 
And in the first instance, OHP consisted of a collective of already existing high quality open access journals in philosophy, cultural studies, literary criticism and political theory. While all these journals are of high quality, many had a problem generating a high level of prestige because they're online journals rather than print and because although at least two are over 10 years old now, most are relatively new and you can get quality quite quickly but prestige takes longer to build up. So the idea was to bring them together under a single umbrella, that of OHP, and raise their profile and level of prestige in the eyes of academics and administrators by way of a meta-refereeing process. So to this end, and I'll show you the previous slide, to this end OHP is an editorial board that, include, that includes Alan Bardieu, Jonathan Culler, Stephen Greenblatt, and Gayatri Spivak, and an editorial oversight group consisting of a rotating body of 13 scholars drawn from the editorial board, which it uses to assess its titles. The plan when we first started was to spend the first few years establishing a name and a reputation for OHP with its journals before proceeding to tackle the more difficult problem of publishing book-length material open access. Things have developed much faster than we anticipated, however. As soon as OHP launched, a lot of people asked us when we were going to publish books. So almost by popular demand, we launched an OHP monograph project. And the idea is to move forward both open access publishing in the humanities and the open access publishing of humanities monographs. And we've launched our monograph project with five high-profile book series, as you can see. The idea is for these liquid books to be produced in an open, collaborative, decentralised, multi-user generated fashion. Not just by, that, by their initial authors and editors, but by a multiplicity of often anonymous collaborators distributed around the world. Indeed, at the time of writing the project, it has over 100 users from Brazil, South Africa, Hong Kong, the Lebanon, Europe, the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, uh, among other places. What's more, their particular form, authors have the freedom to include whole books in their liquid books, along with pages, snippets, references, annotations, yeah. links to related material, even podcasts and YouTube clips, means many of these books can't be published as printed volumes at all. They're more specific to the digital medium than that. All of which is designed to raise a number of challenging and provocative questions. Can we produce critical and cultural theory in this collaborative way? What does it do for ideas of the author, publication, content creation, quality control, even of the book itself? The Liquid Book series can be positioned as addressing an issue raised, raised by net theorist Gert Loving. Why are wikis not utilised more to create, develop and change theory and theoretical concepts? Instead of theory, for all its rethinking of concepts, such as writing, the author, the subject, the text, I might add, continuing to be considered the terrain of the sole author who contemplates the world, preferably offline, surrounded by a pile of, pile of books, a fountain pen and a notebook. But to what extent does the ability of users to rewrite, remix, reversion these books render untenable any attempt to impose a limit and unity on them as works? And what are the political, ethical and social consequences of such liquidity for ideas that depend on the concept of the work for their effectivity? Those concerning individualised attribution, citation, copyright, intellectual property, fair use, academic success, promotion and so on. We wanted to use a wiki for raising such questions because the networked, distributed structure of wikis means anyone anywhere can potentially join in, publish and participate. And this last point is especially important with regard to the centre periphery model of the geopolitics of knowledge speaking of research without borders. 
In this model, there are just a few nations at the center of the global academic and publishing networks who are exporting and, in effect, universalizing their knowledge. And interestingly enough, this is the case with even the most radical of theoretical works, works which, in their content, explicitly try to undermine such center-periphery models. The use of the wiki medium of communication can be assistance because it makes it possible to produce a multiplicitous academic and publishing network, one with a far more complex, fluid, distributed, and dissented structure. Now, the really interesting thing about all this is the way it encourages us to think differently about the book itself as something that's not fixed and unified with definite limits and clear material edges, but rather liquid and living, constantly open to being annotated, edited, updated, and reimagined, with publication no longer being conceived as an end point or fixed moment in time, but simply as a node in an ongoing process or flow. with little books, we're making it a lot more open. Not because we're not going to make any judgments. We just want to say, firstly, to say, look, the judgments that we're taking, you know, try and um, show that they're not just natural and fixed, that we can't change them and make different kind of judgments. And just try and mush, move to that other side where we're going to see what happens. How can we judge more collaboratively? Uh, collectively produce texts, what are they going to look like? How would we still maintain notions of quality and value? I should stress, because um, I'll not be very, uh, very pleased with me if I don't, OHP has very kind of traditional peer review system. The way it's organized might be kind of avant-garde and radical, but it's system, this is why we've got, you know, I show all the, the slides with all the kind of heavyweight hitters. It's kind of very traditional, serious, that's the point of it. That's the strategy. If we don't have that, then people will still have that attitude of pu publishing open access and publishing books open access is it's kind of not serious, it's not proper, we can't afford to do it, it's not legitimate, it's not quality control. It is. I mean, probably more than a lot of print on paper publishers. So. But again, uh, and Carl started with that quote about open access, it's not kind of... Uh, it's not this thing that sometimes people in open access have this moralistic, it's an inherent good and we have to kind of roll it out everywhere. It isn't. A lot of people uh, in South America, for example, uh, are nervous about open access and cautious. And sometimes when I go to open access conferences, the why governments are behind it is because they think, you know, I go to conferences in Europe and they're saying, we have to get our knowledge out there, we have to compete with the Americans, we have to make ourselves noticed on the global market. And they think we have to have our knowledge dominant and it has to be out there. Uh, and so people in some places of the world, that are outside that, see this as just a way of the West, the North, making their knowledge dominant and getting out there. Uh, so there's certain people that are cautious, which is why I was talking about having different kind of networks and different kind of publishing centers that makes it possible that you have a multinodal network. So it's not just open access makes... Uh, North America or Europe or the UK and their knowledge out there that there are other parts of the world that can, can start publishing their research and, and globalising that if you like.